In this video, I wanted to see if I could beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Storm Silver. Pokemon Storm Silver is another ultra hard Dreano ROM hack. Storm Silver aims to keep the basic structure of Soul Silver while upping the difficulty to 11 in a similar vein to Blaze Black 2 or Renegade Platinum. Storm Silver reworks Gym Leader's teams, adds new boss battles, and improves the AI. This ROM hack also adds every single Pokemon that existed up until Gen 4 as an encounter, meaning we're going to have plenty of the exciting Pokemon to tackle this ultra hard challenge. I'm going to need all the Pokemon I can get my hands on though, because in a Pokemon Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's considered dead and must be released. I can also only catch the first encounter per area. The rest of the rules for this run can be seen on screen now and in the description. I've got some decent experience with these kind of ROM hacks at this point, so let's go see if I've got what it takes to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Storm Silver. Before we start, I would say if you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe. It really helps me out being a smaller channel. Oh, and if you want to see our adventure continue into Kanto, remember to leave a like. If we can hit 500 likes on this video, you might just see a part two. With that self plug out the way, let's get on with the video. So first things first, we've got to pick our starter. And being Johto, we've got the choice of the Fiery Mole Cyndaquil, the Snapping Croc Totodile, or the Houseplant Chikorita. I have no idea if any of these starters have been given a buff or new typings, so I decide to let the first digit of my trainer ID decide on what I'm using, and it looks like I'm getting Mark the Cyndaquil. With Mark by my side, it's time to start our adventure, and our first stop is Mr. Pokemon's house. Once we reach Mr. Pokemon's house, however, for some strange reason, a nightmare from my childhood is waiting for me. Luckily, she doesn't want to battle, but instead gives me an Eevee. I'd never say no to the Swiss army knife that is Eevee, and with Phil acquired, we can head back home and start our journey for real. That means it's time to collect our early game encounters, and there's a lot of them to get through, so let's get this show on the road. Firstly, on Route 29, I catch Tim the Bidoof, and with Tim acquired, I've pretty much won this run already. Kind of seems a bit pointless catching anything else. Just using Tim would probably make this game a bit too easy, so I decide to carry on catching encounters, and on Route 46, I catch a Geodude who I name James. Geodude in the base game of Soul Silver is really useful against the first three gyms, so I'm sure James will be an excellent addition to any of my teams. Moving on from Route 46 to Cherry Grove, I'm actually already already given access to the old rod, meaning I can fish up a Krabby called Ben. Moving north, we find an adorable Shinx, who I'm sure will be helpful against Falkner, who we named Charlie. Our last encounter before Violet City, we find a Chingling I named Sarah. Chinglings often suck, but maybe Sarah's gotten a buff. Arriving in Violet City, we then get even more encounters. Firstly, like in Renegade Platinum, if we pass this man's quiz in the Pokemon Center, we get a choice of Kanto starter. So once we pass with complete ease, Much, much, much later. We get ourselves a Bulbasaur named Aaron. That just leaves three more encounters, a Magikarp I fish up in the ruins of Alf I name Lucy, a Hoppit I name Harry who I find on Route 32, and last and also kind of least, I find a Zigzagoon in Sprout Tower who I name Ryan. That was a lot of encounters. From this point on, I'll only be mentioning the useful ones. But with all of those encounters out the way, we're almost ready for the first gym. Just got to get through some evolutions. Mark is able to evolve into Quella, Tim is able to evolve into Bee Barrel, and Charlie is able to evolve into Luxio. We also get a choice of what evolution we want, and I've heard Glaceon makes the first few gyms a breeze, so I decide to grab myself a Childor and evolve Phil into Glaceon. With our team nice and filled out, we're ready for the first gym battle of this run, and let's just say evolving Phil into Glaceon was 100% the correct choice. Falconer starts with Doduo, who is outsped and goes down to a single Icy Wind. Second is Tharfetch, who outspeeds and lands a weak aerial ace before going down in one hit. Third is Swablu, who amazingly also goes down in one hit. Fourth is Chatot and lands an uproar before going down to another icy wind. Fifth is Murkrow, who lands a faint attack before going down in one hit. That faint attack actually brought Phil slightly low at this point, but that doesn't matter because Falconer's last Pokemon is just a Pidgeotto, who also goes down to one icy wind. Easy. I thought this game was meant to be hard. Clearly, the rest of this game is going to go that smoothly. First gym badge acquired. With the first gym completely destroyed, then we're back on the road, and that means more encounters. I actually immediately 
immediately make a pretty big mistake though and catch another Pokemon on Route 32, despite the fact that I've already caught Harry here. Unfortunately, mistakes like this happen sometimes, but it's still annoying. Even more annoying is the fact that the extra Pokemon I find on Route 32 is Emily the Ninkada, who would also give me access to the absolutely broken Shedinja if I wanted to use it. I decide against using this though, as it is just too much of an instant win condition in a lot of cases. Moving on then, with Emily the extra encounter acquired, we head all the way to Ilex Thorest before we get another useful encounter. Instead of catching one of the many bug types I could find in this forest, I decide to hatch my Togepi egg here so Stan joins the party. That's the last notable encounter I get before Bugsy, so after defeating our first Team Rocket admin and evolving Stan into Togetic and Lucy into Gyarados, we're ready for our second gym battle of the run. So Bugsy starts with Butter 3 and I start with Phil. Butter 3 outspeeds and lands a weak U-turn, meaning Icy Wind goes into Heracross instead of Butter 3. Annoyingly, Icy Wind isn't doing enough to two-shot, so I'm now forced to switch into Stan, who takes a weak bug bite on the switch. From there, I'm able to get off a strong extra sensory that nearly KOs, while Heracross goes through a useless counter. That's perfect because I can now encore the Heracross into counter as Bugsy heals, and then safely KO with two more attacks. Second is Yamma, so I switch into James as the Dragonfly gets off the Detect, getting very lucky on these switches. Of course, before I can get off the Rock Throw, Bugsy goes for another U-turn, bringing in Pinsir. Pinsir takes good damage from a rock throw, but it's not enough for the KO, so I switch back into Stan, who takes a weak vital throw. Pinsir then gets off a bind, before going down to an exosensory crit. Gotta love super luck. Third, the Yamma comes back out, so I switch back into James, who takes an ancient power. James then has to take a strong U-turn before a rock throw KOs Butter 3. Fourth is Yammer again, so I switch into Phil on another Detect. Phil does have to take a strong Ancient Power, but then a single Icy Wind is enough to KO the stupid bug. Fifth is Beedrill, who gets off the strong Twin Needles before taking an Icy Wind surprisingly well. Phil is getting pretty low at this point, so I decide to switch into Lucy, who tanks a cut like it's nothing. A single bite is then enough to KO Bugsy's B. Last the Bugsy is his Cypher, meaning this fight isn't over yet. I decide to stay in and see how much a single bite does, and a wing attack does a stupid amount to Lucy before a bite does minimal damage. I decide, with Cypher hitting that hard and the rest of my team very beat up, my best bet is probably switching Lucy in and out to lower this thing's attack with Intimidate. So I switch into Stan, who survives a strong wing attack, before switching back into Lucy. who of course gets crit. Rest in peace Lucy. Thankfully, with a single Intimidate, Mark is able to come in and survive two wing attacks before carrying Cypher with a blaze boosted flame wheel. We've done it, we've got our second gym badge, but it cost us one of our strongest team members. It's only going to be an uphill battle from this point onwards. Before leaving town, we do get ambushed by our rival, but thankfully he's not at the point of being a threat yet, so we're able to carry on through Ilex Thorest, and um, yeah, that's one way to remind me I'm playing a ROM hack. After moving on from whatever the hell that was, on our way out of the Ilex Thorest, Cynthia decides to give me another heart attack. Thankfully, she still doesn't want to battle though, and instead gives us an odd keystone. This means if we run all the way back to Slowpoke Well and throw the stone in, we can catch ourselves a Spiritomb. Now, annoyingly, Spiritomb has been slightly nerfed in this ROM hack, as Dark types are no longer resistant to Ghost, meaning Spiritomb now does have one weakness. Despite this, James is still an absolute monster, so I'm happy to add him to my team. Running all the way back through Ilex Thorest again then, we eventually make it to Goldenrod City, where we get our choice of Sinnoh starter. Picking between these three is always a difficult decision, but I decide on Ben the Chimchar, who should be really helpful against the next gym. We're then able to head head north from Goldenrod to grab our last notable encounter before the next gym, where on Route 35 we find a Staravia I name Sam. Sam doesn't have Intimidate, which is unfortunate, but can't go wrong with another strong normal flying type. With Sam added to our roster, it's now time to take on the third gym battle of this run, the Boogeyman and many people's childhoods, Whitney. Now I do have one advantage against Whitney, and that's that half her team can't hurt James, so that's going to make this fight a lot easier. So let's jump right in. Whitney starts with Lickitung and I start with Stan. I immediately decide to try and put Lickitung to sleep 
so Stan gets off a yawn before being hit by an attract. That would be annoying, but I was planning to switch anyway, so I send out Ben as a disable does nothing before Licky Tongue falls asleep. Two rock smashes then just miss the KO by what looks like 1 HP, meaning Whitney uses one of her potions, but that only means Ben has to get off one more rock smash for the KO. Second is Low Punny, so I immediately send in James as Low Punny sets up an agility. Now because this rabbit can't attack James, Whitney hard switches on the following turn into Wigglytuff. That's not a problem though, because as Wigglytuff comes out, James lands a hypnosis. It's then a simple case of switching into Aaron, who is able to KO with two super effective sludge bombs and then a single leech seed. Low Punny then comes back out so we can just send James back in to force Whitney to switch again. Annoyingly though, James actually misses Hypnosis this time on the switch. This lets Clefable get off an attract, which of course means James fails to land a second Hypnosis. I'm nothing if not stubborn though, so I decide to carry on trying to put this annoying Moon Pig to sleep and James actually lands the attack. This means it's a simple case of sending Aaron back in and KOing with Sludge Bombs and a Leech Seed. Next to Whitney is the Low Punny for the 800th time, so I switch back into James. This forces Whitney to switch again, and this time it's Miltank's turn to be put to sleep. Of course, Miltank has a Lumberry, meaning I'm gonna have to land another Hypnosis if I want this cow to stay asleep. Luckily, James pulls through, like always, after taking a strong body slam. With the cow asleep, I start going for Dream Eaters that aren't doing a huge amount. It does get James back to full HP though, meaning that when the Miltank wakes up and lands a body slam, James is healthy enough to take a body slam before putting the cow back to sleep. Two more Dream Eaters are then enough for the KO. Last, the Whitney are Low Punny and Stantler, both of whom can't hit James, meaning we've got this fight in the bag. After many faint attacks, they both go down, meaning we've won our third gym badge. Moving on from Goldenrod then, we're able to make our way to Ecritique City, and we actually only find one more notable encounter along the way. On Route 37, we're able to catch another normal flying type, Oliver the Noctowl. Now, Noctowl isn't amazing, but he will be pretty useful against the upcoming gym. Speaking of which, after beating up our rival, it's time for our fourth gym battle against the ghost type leader, Morty. So let's jump in and see how this goes. Morty starts with Duskull, and I start with Oliver. Like Whitney, Morty is forced to switch because Duskull can't hit Oliver, meaning I can get off an air cutter for three and to shop it. A second air cutter is then enough for an easy KO. Second is Gengar. Morty clearly pulling out the big guns early. If I can get some damage off on this monster though, James will be able to come in and KO, but that does mean somebody's probably going to go down here. Gengar immediately starts with the Hypnosis, which amusingly doesn't affect Oliver thanks to Insomnia. This lets Oliver get off a Confusion for three that even confuses. With that kind of luck, I might be able to take down Gengar here with no deaths. Unfortunately though, Oliver's luck didn't quite hold up and Gengar is able to get off a Thunderbolt that does massive massive damage. A second confusion does bring Gengar low, but it isn't enough for a KO. This means I don't have a choice but to let Oliver go down here, so I stay in and watch as a second thunderbolt thrives my bird. Rest in peace buddy, your sacrifice was ultimately needed. With Oliver down, I'm able to send in James, who gets off the priority shadow sneak, taking down Morty's most threatening Pokemon. Third for Morty is Duskull again, so I decide to switch into Thill. On the switch, Duskull lands a Will-O-Wisp, which is on honestly fine, as Thill is a special attacker. A single Ice Beam then just misses the KO before Duskull lands a Confuse Ray, which is slightly annoying. I assume Morty will heal on the following turn, however, so I decide to get a 3 switch into Tim to shake off the confusion. Duskull again can't hurt normal types, so Morty switches into Haunter, who is nearly one-shot by an Aquatail. Really can't get any one-shots this match, can I? Tim on the following turn then gets hit by a Hypnosis, and I decide I might as well try and spend a turn waking up, but Tim carries on napping, meaning he has to take a really hard Dream Eater. That did way more than I was expecting, and there's a high chance Haunter will go through another Dream Eater here on the following turn, so I switch into James. On the switch, my prediction is correct, meaning I get James into 3, and then a single Shadow Sneak is enough for another KO. Easy. Then the world's most persistent Duskull comes out, so I immediately switch back into Tim. Of course, Tim is already asleep, so the Will-O-Wisp the Duskull tries to land does 
nothing. Now I know Morty will switch here, so I decide it's best to send out Charlie as Morty switches into Mistrevious. Mistrevious then traps Charlie with a mean look before a single night slash brings Mistrevious into the red. Mistrevious then cripples Charlie with a will o wisp, but thankfully a second night slash still picks up another KO. Fifth for Morty, to no one's surprise, is Duskull. Honestly, I think Morty has sent out this Duskull more times than I can count at this point. You should all know the drill by now though. I switch into James and then Morty switches into Sableye as I switch into Stan. Sableye goes through a torment as I waste a turn going through an extra sensory that does nothing. Sableye then gets off a Shadow Claw which is perfect as I can now lock Sableye into Shadow Claw with Encore. With Sableye locked into a ghost type move I'm perfectly safe to send in Tim who spends a few more turns napping before waking up and then Tim is able to KO the Sableye with two Aqua Tails. Then for the final time Morty sends out Duskull and Morty can no longer switch this annoying ghost out so two more Aqua Tails are enough for the victory. Pretty annoying but easy gym fight there even if it did require a sacrifice. Fourth gym down, four more to go. We've now got quite the trip before our next gym fight and first things first we've got a couple of evolutions. Firstly Aaron is able to evolve into Venusaur and Charlie is able to evolve into Luxray. Then heading west we're able to pick up a couple more useful encounters. Firstly on Route 39 we're able to find a speedy little Elekid I name Eric. Electrovire has been made a fighting type in this ROM hack which is a pretty unique type combination so he should be a useful asset going forward. Heading south into Olivine City we can grab a good rod and then fish up another really important encounter, Sam the Star. Staryu. Staryu is an excellent fast special attacker who has great coverage. Only one problem with Sam, they're only evolved with a water stone which means I have to go and spend way too long playing mini games in the Pokeathlon. Honestly these mini games are pretty fun on an actual DS but because I'm using my um very special DS that may or may not have a mouse attached, these mini games are straight up torture. Sam better be worth it. With Sam evolved we're able to evolve Emily and Harry into their final forms meaning we're ready to face down Chuck and his fighting types once he's done with whatever kind of training this is. Chuck's team would be super scary but luckily I've come up with a way that should make this a lot easier. A man in the Pokemon Center gives me a choice band which if given to Emily and combined with her speed boost ability should mean she can rip through Chuck's team. With a strong team of backup Pokemon just in case Emily can't carry let's go see if this plan works. First up for Chuck is Primeape who has outsped and KO'd with a single aerial ace. Good start. Second is Polyrath and I'm actually worried that even with a choice band Emily won't one shot. I decide because of this it's worth playing it safe and switching into Sam. On the switch Sam takes an ice punch that doesn't do a lot. A Psybeam then does a decent amount into Polyrath and gets the confusion. That's the second time that's happened in these gym fights. That's super lucky even if the extra damage from Polyrath's confusion does activate its citrus berry. A second Psybeam then crits and KOs the Polyrath. Sam was clearly worth traumatizing myself with annoying mini games. Third for Chuck is Breloom, so I switch back into Emily. On the switch, Emily has to take a Bullet Seed, but it's four times resisted, so it does next to nothing. Emily then has to take a Priority Mac Punch that also does nothing, before KOing with an Aerial Ace. Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan then also suffer the same fate. That just leaves Harry Armor. I decide Emily's been doing so well that even if she can't one shot, she should be able to get off some good damage before I'm forced to switch. So I stay in and try to get off an aerial ace but Harry Armor goes for a fake out that crits and does stupid damage. Okay definitely not staying in anymore so I switch into Aaron who takes a resisted cross chop on the switch. I then start trying to go for sleep powder but of course Aaron misses and has to take an earthquake that actually does a lot. I decide I'm not going to risk another one of those so I decide to switch into Harry who thanks to a wide lens actually lands a sleep powder. Harry then lands a leech seed while the Hariyama naps before I switch into Stan. Of course on the switch Hariyama wakes up and gets off a cross chop but Stan is four times resistant so it does literally nothing. Sam is then able to get off a yawn as the second cross chop misses. Just got to get off a few attacks here and wait for Hariyama to fall asleep or Stan will just end this fight with a crit. Not going to complain but I did put a lot of effort into making that monster fall asleep and then getting it seeded for it all to feel like a little bit of a waste of time. Oh well with that crit 
we've won our fifth gym badge. Moving on from Chuck and his weird waterfall training then, normally we wouldn't have much to do for Jasmine other than deliver her some medicine in the lighthouse. But this ROM hack has decided to add what everybody who has ever played the base Soul Silver and Heart Gold has been clamoring for. More Team Rocket fights. Woo! Like honestly, there's already a lot of Team Rocket stuff in the base games. Why they decided to add more, I'll never know. Luckily, it's more tedious than difficult and we're rewarded for our efforts with another really strong encounter. This time in the Safari Zone, we're able to catch a Magnemite I named Maggie. With all of that out the way and after evolving Mark into Typhlosion, it's time for our sixth gym battle against Jasmine, the Steel Type Trainer. And this one's not going to be easy. So Jasmine starts with her Matang and I start with James. A single Sucker Punch very nearly gets the one shot before James takes a laughably weak Earthquake. I now assume Jasmine will heal on the following turn, so instead of going through a Sucker Punch, I go through a Shadow Sneak that does slightly less than half. A second Sucker Punch is then enough for the KO. Second is Steelix, so I decide to switch into Tim. Unfortunately for Tim, he's a bit of a sacrificial lamb here, as I'm hoping he'll be able to get off some damage on the Steelix so Sam can come in and KO. So Tim takes a screech on the switch before landing a surf that does a massive amount but unfortunately fails to take down the steelix. This means Tim's fate is sealed as he takes a critical hit earthquake and goes down. Rest in peace my chunky boy. With Tim down I'm able to send in Sam who KOs with a single surf. Plan worked well there, just a shame we had to let Tim go down. Third is Magneton so I switch into Mark who takes a strong thunderbolt on the switch and gets paralyzed. Being paralyzed here is huge because I can no longer outspeed and KO on the following turn, but because I don't really have the safe switch, I decide I'm gonna have to let Mark go down here. So I stay in and watch as Mark takes another Thunderbolt and he survives on 1 HP, letting him get off the flamethrower to take down the Zappy Magnet. That was way too close, but we're not out of the woods just yet. Fourth for Jasmine is Bronzong, so I switch into Charlie on a Gyro Ball that does next to nothing. A Night Slash then does a massive amount of damage, but annoyingly just misses the KO, meaning Charlie has to take a Hypnosis and is put to sleep. Thankfully, Bronzong still can't really touch Charlie, so after a couple more turns, Charlie does wake up and is able to take down the overly large bear with a Night Slash. Fifth is Fortress, so I decide to switch into James. Annoyingly, James takes a lot more from a Bug Bite than I'm expecting, leaving him at risk to a crit. Because of this, I decide to switch into Charlie, but for some reason, instead of going through the super effective payback on the Switch, Fortress goes through a Bug Bite, leaving Charlie on 2 HP. This is looking really bad, and I'm running out of options here. I decide maybe there's a chance Fortress will now explode, meaning I should send out James. Of course, my prediction is wrong again, meaning James takes another bug bite, bringing him into the red. My team's taking a lot of damage here, so I decide to send in Maggie, who takes another strong payback, and then I switch into Sam, who also takes a payback. With Sam out and so low on HP, I'm once again hoping that Fortress will explode, so I go through a protect, and annoyingly, Fortress goes through a bug bite. That's so annoying, because it probably means I'm gonna have to let Sam go down here to get off some damage on Fortress, so I go through a surf and then Sam is hit back by a bug bite that takes down my starfish. Rest in peace Sam. Now could I have avoided this death? Yes. Were there easier ways to take down the fortress instead of constantly switching and hoping it exploded? Yes. But you know we all make mistakes and thankfully Maggie is still healthy enough to come in and take down the fortress with a thunderbolt and then KO Scarberry in the same way. That's it. We've beaten our sixth gym battle in the most unoptimal way possible but a win's a win. With Jasmine down I now get to head to Mahogany Town where I get the joy of fighting Team Rocket again. Before that though, I to head to the Lake of Rage to catch myself a Feebas. Now, unlike in Renegade Platinum, Dan isn't a fairy type, but Milotic is still a pretty strong water tank. Just gotta get Dan like 10 haircuts first so he'll evolve. How do you give a fish a haircut, you ask? I have no idea. So let's move on from that strange mental image back to Mahogany Town where Riley and Buck are chilling in this house and Riley gives me a Lucario egg. I eventually hatch this egg into Luke and Lucario is a super strong steel fighting type so I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of him down the line. Back onto Route 42, I remember to grab the
volcanic ore that lets me evolve Maggie into Magnazone, and then after evolving Ben into Infernape and Millie the Maril into Azumarill, it's time for our seventh gym battle. Now, Price is an ice type leader, and while ice is pretty strong offensively, defensively, ice just sucks, so I'm hoping this gym fight won't be as hard as the last one. So Price starts with the Bomber Snow, and I start with Ben, and I'll be completely honest, with the choice band, Ben is able to one-shot a Bomber Snow, Dugon, Lapras, and Mamoswine with a single close combat each. Huh, that was easy. Two more to go, the first of whom is Glalie. Glalie has a really high physical defense, but its special defense is rubbish, so it's a simple case of switching into Milotic and then KOing with a couple surfs while it just kind of floats there and takes it. Nice. So last is Throstlass. Shouldn't be difficult, right? Well, it turns out this Throstlass likes to be very, very annoying. So first, I send in Maggie on a Blizzard that does low damage before taking a powerful Shadow Ball. Maggie survives though, meaning she's able to land a Thunder Wave. Okay, that should make this ghost easier to deal with. So I go through a Thunderbolt that does just over half, and then Maggie is brought really low by a second Shadow Ball. Unfortunately, I now need to switch, and I don't really have a good choice here for taking a Shadow Ball, so I decide on Millie, because I'm not being funny, if Millie dies, who cares? So I send in Millie, and Millie just must have prayed to some sort of god, because Throstlass gets paralyzed. This lets Maggie get off an Aqua Jet that just misses the KO, and then Throstlass gets paralyzed again. This must be a good luck Azumarill or something. Of course, Price annoyingly heals on the following turn, meaning Millie is able to get off two more Aqua Jets before for taking a Thunderbolt. I was expecting Thunderbolt to KO Millie there, but surprisingly it didn't. Millie has put in so much work here, I decide I might as well and try and keep her alive. This means switching into James on a Shadow Ball that would have KO'd had I not given James a Caspi Berry, which reduces the damage. A single Sucker Punch is then enough to take down Throstlass and win us the match. That's the seventh gym taken down, pretty easy fight, even if we had some issues at the end there. After winning our seventh gym badge, I remember to evolve Sam into Star Raptor, and then we get the joy of more Team Rocket fights. Thankfully, I've got some really strong options for team members at this point, so we're able to breeze through these fights pretty easily, all things considered. With Team Rocket defeated then, it's time for our final gym battle of the run, the Dragon-type trainer, Claire. So Claire starts with Dragonair, and I start with Phil. Phil is able to outspeed the Blue Serpent and one-shot with an Ice Beam. Easy. Sure the rest of this fight will be that simple. Second is Salamance and I'm going to be completely honest, I somehow overlooked the fact that Salamance had Fire Blast. Thank god it misses, because there was no way Phil would have survived that. Fire Blast doesn't connect though, meaning another Ice Beam takes down the Salamance. Third is Alteria, who does land a Flamethrower, but it only does 50%, meaning Phil is able to hit back with a third Ice Beam that KOs the Fluffy Dragon. Fourth for Claire is Gyarados, so I switch into Stan as Gyarados goes through a Dragon Dark. That's scary, but on the following turn, Quick Claw activates, meaning I'm able to lock Gyarados into Dragon Dance with an Encore. If I'm honest, even if Quick Claw hadn't activated there, even with an attack boost, it's unlikely Stam would have been one shot. Can't complain though, because I'm then able to freely switch into Maggie and then KO with the Thunderbolt. Fifth is Kingdra, and I decide to stay in to try and get off some damage, but of course Kingdra goes for a swagger, meaning Maggie hurts herself in confusion. I decide to stay in and try again on the following turn, but Maggie takes a massive amount from a Hydro Pump before hurting herself again. I suppose I've probably used up all my good luck at the start of this fight. Putting Kingdra to sleep with Stan is probably my best bet from this point, so I switch on another strong Hydro Pump. Stan then has to take a Blizzard that brings him really low but he survives and is able to land a yawn. I now just need to survive one more turn before I'm pretty much in the clear, so I switch into Eric on another Hydro Pump as Kingdra falls asleep. I decide to spend a turn setting up Light Screen just in case Kingdra wakes up before I start going for Thunder Punches. Annoyingly, Eric is only able to get off two Thunder Punches before Kingdra wakes up, but thankfully it only misses a Hydro Pump. That should mean, barring a crit here, Eric can take one more hit thanks to Light Screen, so I'm safe to get off a third Thunder Punch, take another scary Hydro Pump, and then KO with another Thunder Punch. Or Claire will heal. Kinda forgot she had those, if I'm honest. I still have Dan though, who is able to come in on a Dragon Pulse, now that Kingdra has run out of PP for Hydro Pump, and then KO with three Ice Beams. 
that got a little close there at the end, but somehow we made it through our last gym battle with no casualties, winning us our last gym badge of the run. We do have a little bit to do before we can wrap this game up and take down the Elite Thor. Firstly, we have to take down the Kimono Girls, which proves to be surprisingly easy. Ben is able to take down Umbreon, James is able to sucker punch the Espeon, Ben sets the Leafeon and Glaceon on fire, Dan actually nearly goes down fighting the Flareon because it's able to set up the sun, but of course Ben comes in and finishes off the Fluffball. Aaron takes down the Jolteon with no issues, and then Maggie is able to take down everybody's favourite furry joke with no issues. Easy. With the Kimono Girls down, it's then a simple case of heading to the Whirl Islands to go KO Lugia, and with Lugia down it's time to head to Victory Road. In Johto Falls, we find our last notable encounter of the run, a Slowpoke we name Oliver. What do you mean we already had a Pokemon named Oliver? I have no idea what you're talking about. With Oliver acquired, it's a quick run through Victory Road and one last easy rival fight before we've arrived at our final test, the Elite Four. Do we have what it takes to beat Pokemon Storm Silver on our first attempt? Let's go find out. Firstly, let's see the group of friends I've decided to bring with me. First, we've got Eric the Electrovire, whose speedy electric punches will be a vital asset against a lot of Pokemon we're going to be up against. Second is Stan the Togekiss, whose yawn and encore support is invaluable. Third is Oliver the Slowbro, the newest member of the team. Oliver has the most to prove going into this, but his bulk and water psychic typing make him the perfect partner for a lot of my team members. Fourth is Phil the Glaceon, who's been with us from the beginning. Phil's ice beams will rip Lance apart, just gotta make sure he gets to that point. Fifth is Maggie the Magneton, whose steel typing makes him a great switch for a lot of my team. Last, but by no means least, we've got Ben the Infernape, whose speed and power should mean he picks up KOs left and right. Our team is looking really strong, but this Elite Four is not going to be a walk in the park. Let's go end this. So first up for this Elite Four is Will, the Psychic Type Trainer. Will starts with Jinx, and I start with Ben, who is immediately able to melt the creepy ice type with a single flamethrower. Second is Slowbro, and I decided to try and put this happy pink boy to sleep with Stan before anything else. So I switch into Stan on a Surf that doesn't do too much before going for an Encore. Stan then has to take a second Surf that leaves him really low. I will survive another Surf here, but it's going to be a bit of a close one. So Stan gets off a Yawn, and I hold my breath, and Stan survives. Okay, shouldn't be taking risks like that so early into this Elite Four, but it worked out. With Slowbro about to fall asleep, I switch into Eric, who has to take a single Surf before Slowbro naps. Three Thunder Punches are then enough for the KO, as Will heals with the full restore. Third is Gardevoir, so I switch into Maggie on a resisted Psychic. Gardevoir then wastes a turn setting up a Reflect, as Thunderbolt does less than half. Maggie then has to take a second Psychic that brings her to 50%, as another Thunderbolt just misses the KO. Gardevoir then decides to be a b and put Maggie to sleep. Luckily, thanks to an Ipperberry, Maggie is able to survive two more Psychics, but she still doesn't wake up. This means I'm going to have to send someone in to finish this Gardevoir off, and I decide on Eric, but first I switch through Oliver, as he's the only Pokemon other than Maggie I have that resists Psychic. So I switch into Oliver on a Psychic that does more than I'm hoping, and then I switch into Eric on a Thunderbolt. Eric takes a lot from a Thunderbolt, but he still tanks the hit before KOing the Gardevoir with the Thunder Punch. Fourth for Will is Zatu, who goes down to a single Thunder Punch. Fifth is Lunatone, and I would be in a lot of trouble here if it wasn't for Stan. I know Lunatone will go through an Earth Power here, meaning I'm three to switch into Stan, and then lock the moon into an Earth Power. With it locked into Earth Power, it can't hit Stan, which means I can freely set up a Wish to heal Stan and put the floating moon to sleep. Then, once it falls asleep, I can set up a second Wish so that Eric is also healed when he's sent out. Perfect, as Eric can now KO the moon with two thunder punches. Last the will is Solrock and I decide to switch into Stan again, expecting Solrock to go through an earthquake, but instead it goes to the Zen headbutt. Not sure why, but luckily Stan survives and it's just a simple case of sending out Oliver, tanking a Zen headbutt and a very scary stone edge before KOing with a surf. With that, we've taken Will down. That fight was a lot more difficult than I was expecting, but we made it through deathless and that's what matters. Second for this elite Thor is Koga, who I'm hoping will be a lot 
lot easier than the last fight. So Koga starts with Venomoth and I start with Ben. Just like the last fight, Ben is immediately able to get a KO with a flamethrower on turn 1. Perfect. Second is Tentacruel, so I switch into Eric. On the switch, Tentacruel just goes for a protect, meaning I get Eric in for 3. Tentacruel does outspeed on the following turn, but thankfully it decides not to go for an attack and goes for a sword stance instead, meaning Eric is 3 to 1 shot with a thunder punch. Third is Toxicroak, so I switch into Stan on a cross chop that does next to nothing. Now, I had planned to lock Toxicroak into cross chop here with an encore, but to my surprise, Toxicroak actually outspeeds and lands a really strong poison jab. Stan survives though, meaning he's able to get off an encore. With Toxicroak stuck using a poison type move, I can switch into Maggie with complete safety and then KO with two Thunderbolts. Fourth is Crobat for some reason, who gets off a double team, but Maggie doesn't have any time to deal with that clearly and she immediately lands the Thunderbolt anyway, which gets the one hit KO. Fifth is Muck, who amusingly keeps going for Substitute, despite the fact that Maggie can immediately remove the Substitute with the Thunderbolt. This means Maggie just has to take a couple of weak rock slides when Muck decides to stop hurting itself before taking down the Muck with Thunderbolts. Easy. Last the Koga is wheezing, so I switch into Ben on a Protect. Ben then very nearly one shots with a Flamethrower, but just misses the KO, meaning he has to take a rather strong Thunder. This is annoying, but not the end of the world, as Ben is able to safely KO the overgrown ball of gas with two more flamethrowers after Koga heals with a Thor Restore. Okay, that fight was honestly pretty three. Two down, two to go. Now, I thought the last fight was free, but Bruno shows me that I should never underestimate just how bad he is, even in a ROM hack like this. So Bruno starts with Hitmontop, and I start with Stan. Bruno starts the fight with a Fake Out, but that's perfect because it means Stan can outspeed and lock Hitmontop into Fake Out on the following turn. From there, Stan is completely safe to KO with Air Slashes. Good start. Second is Hitmon Lee, who is able to get off a very strong Stone Edge before being hit by another Encore. With Hitmon Lee locked into Stone Edge, Maggie is able to come in, take two weak attacks before KOing with a critical hit Thunderbolt. Third for Bruno is Hariyama, whose only fighting type move is Focus Punch. Focus Punch can only land if Hariyama isn't hit before using it, so it's a simple case of staying in with Maggie and constantly removing the substitute the Hariyama sets up before eventually bringing the sumo low enough to where it can't sub anymore, taking a payback and then KOing with the final Thunderbolt. Fourth is Hitmonchan, so I switch into Oliver on a resisted high jump kick. Oliver then has to take a Thunder Punch that hurts but thankfully doesn't KO before surprisingly missing the KO with a Psychic. Like Oliver doesn't have the highest special attack stat in the world, but Hitmonchan's basically made out of wet cardboard so I'm really shocked that I didn't KO. It's not really a huge problem because I can just switch into Eric on another Thunder Punch and then Eric is able to KO with his own Thunder Punch. Fifth the Bruno is Lucario and I just need to get Ben in here to KO. Annoyingly Lucario is probably going to go for a Psychic here but that just means I have to take a bit of the risk with Oliver who survives the attack. Perfect. I can now switch in Ben on an extreme speed and then KO with a Flamethrower. Last the Bruno is Machamp who is Bruno's most threatening Pokemon. I really don't have anyone that can take a hit from this Thor armed monster so I decide to stay in and hope that Ben can at least take one hit and Dynamic Punch misses. That's huge, but Ben is still probably going to have to take a hit here thanks to a Citrus Berry putting Machamp out of the range of being two shot. And Machamp misses again. That's so incredibly lucky as Ben can now take down the Machamp without having to risk any more hits as Bruno heals on the next turn. Perfect. Machamp was the only threatening point during that fight and thanks to some luck we made it through with no issues. Last to this Elite Four is Karen, so let's jump right in. Karen starts with Mightyena and I start with Ben. Even after an Intimidate drop, Ben is still able to one-shot the Dark Puppy with a close combat. Second is Haunchcrow, so I switch into Maggie on a surprisingly strong Brave Bird. Maggie is then hit with a Swagger, but Maggie, being the best UFO-shaped Pokemon a man could ask for, breaks through and KOs with a Thunderbolt. Third is Houndoom, so I switch into Ben on a Heat Wave that should do next to nothing.
Okay, that was scary. <laughs> ben survives though, thank god, and is able to outspeed and KO with a single close combat. What a bad dog. Fifth is Absol, who is also outsped and KO'd by another close combat. I love Ben. Fifth is Karen's own Spiritomb, who is going to be slightly more difficult to deal with. Luckily, as I switch into Stan, Spiritomb goes through a Dark Pulse. That means I can lock it into Dark Pulse with an Encore, and then switch into Eric, who resists the Dark type attack. Eric is then able to KO with a couple of Thunder Punches. Last, the Karen is Umbreon who goes down to a single brick break and then a misclick crit thunder punch. That's the Elite Thor taken down and honestly that wasn't as bad as it could have been outside of the few minor issues with certain Pokemon. That just leaves one last challenge to face before at the end of this journey and that means facing off against Lance. Let's go finish this. So Lance starts with Gyarados and I start with Eric. Gyarados is able to outspeed and one shot with a thunder punch. Good start. Second is Garchomp who Phil could probably one shot but can't outspeed. This means I need another plan, so I decide on my go-to option with situations like these and switch into Stan on an Earthquake. Stan unfortunately can't lock Garchomp into Earthquake because it outspeeds and instead has to take a Fire Fang that burns before landing a Yawn. Garchomp is then able to get off a second Fire Fang before falling asleep as Stan sets up a Wish. An Air Slash then does about a third as Stan's Wish goes off. I then switch into Phil as Garchomp naps. Perfect. Garchomp then does get off a scary Earthquake but Phil survives and lands an Ice Beam for the KO. Third for Lance is Aerodactyl, so I switch into Maggie on a Stone Edge. Quick Claw then activates, allowing Maggie to get off the Thunderbolt for the one shot. That luck with Quick Claw wasn't really needed there because Aerodactyl couldn't really touch Maggie, but not going to complain. Fourth for Lance is Charizard, so I switch into Oliver on a Fire Blast. Charizard then amusingly misses a Fire Blast as Surf brings the Fire Lizard to about a third. Charizard then misses again, allowing Oliver to easily KO with the second Surf. Lance clearly broke a mirror before this fight. Fifth for Lance is the first of his two Dragonites. I decide to stay in with Oliver and get off an Ice Beam and Oliver is very nearly KO'd by a super strong Draco Meteor. Unfortunately, Oliver then misses the KO with an Ice Beam, which means my best choice here is to let Oliver go down on the following turn. So I salute as another Draco Meteor connects and Oliver goes down. Rest in peace buddy, you are the newest member of the team but you proved your worth. Time and time again. With Oliver down, I can send in Phil who KOs with a single Ice Shard. That's it, Lance is down to his last Pokemon, Dragonite number 2, and unfortunately I decide to make another sacrifice here, so I stay in with Phil and get off another Ice Shard and then watch as my longest running team member goes down to an Outrage. Rest in peace Phil, you were the undisputed MVP of this run and I'll never forget you. With Phil down, I send in Maggie who I'm hoping will finish off this dragon. So I go through a Thunderbolt and Quick Claw act Activates again, but unfortunately, Thunderbolt doesn't KO, meaning Dragonite is able to land a really strong outrage. Dragonite is now confused, however, so I still see my best out as trying to KO with Maggie again, and unfortunately, Maggie is hit by an earthquake, taking down my UFO. Rest in peace, Maggie. You carried this team, and your sacrifice will give us the win. With Maggie down, I decide to send in Stan, who is able to land a yawn as the Dragonite hurts himself in confusion. It comes down to this then, if Eric can survive one one wing attack here on the switch, Dragonite will fall asleep and I'll have won, so I switch and hold my breath. And Eric survives, meaning on the following turn, he can end this battle and the run with a single Thunder Punch. We've done it, we've beaten Storm Silver on our very first attempt. What a journey this run has been. While not as enjoyable as later Dreano hacks, this game was still a pleasure to play through. And I hope you guys have enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed playing. Remember to subscribe for more content in the future and leave a like. If we can hit 500 likes on this video, we may just carry on this adventure and explore Kanto. Thanks again for watching, I'll see you all next time.